Well, so we will start then, if you if you want. We will start this meeting, so good morning to, to you all. And well, I, I would say welcome to the University of Coruña, but uh, we are in, in, in a virtual space, so I have to say welcome to, to this space, this unexpected space uh, some months ago, but today is the reality that all of us are living in, in the different countries of the European Union. Well, our university is very proud of uh, leading this project, uh, coordinating all the aspects and, and carrying out one of the work packages, one of the scientific work packages. The, the university is, uh, has been segregated from other university, other 500 years old university, which is the University of Santiago de Compostela. Is, which is one of the oldest in, in Europe. So, well, the object of this meeting is to start with the discussions of the Entrances project uh, that we have been granted by the European Commission in one of the last calls of the Horizon 2020 framework program. But we are also here for celebrating this fact. And in this sense, I would like to congratulate all of you who contributed with your competences and your own ideas to writing this successful proposal. Uh, in a moment in which the research funding in many European countries is being restricted and threatening, the necessary balance among countries in the project of constructing an European space for research and innovation. In a moment where Europeanism is being threatened with controversial political positions, and our economic setups are being questioned. We are delighted to be able to collaboratively work on a project I mean at producing joint knowledge, innovation and excellence. So welcome everyone and uh, well, I hope we will have a three days meeting very productive and, and with a lot of expectations. Let me now uh, give the, the word to Maria Bobadilla, who is uh, our, as I told you before, is our Vice Dean of the Faculty of Education and Science. The Faculty of Education and Science uh, will give uh, physical support for our laboratory and for all the, the management office, you know, which we coordinate the general project. Maria. Uh, Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Um, I want to welcome all of you, Professor Vice Chancellor eh, Casares Gallego, researchers uh, from this um, project. First of all, I want to start by apologizing um, for the background noise that I have here in this building, right? Seems like everyone in Spain is starting to go back to, you know, for, uh, you know, to work on previous projects abandoned before the state of alarm. So I have noise in the background for construction, so I want to apologize for that. <laughs> um, well, um, I want to start by thanking this organizing committee for th thanking uh, Professor Casares Gallego for uh, allowing us, giving us the opportunity to kick off, the, you know, uh, to open this kickoff meeting right, for this highly competitive Horizon 2020 research project, uh, Energy Transitions from Coal and Carbon Effects on Society. I am addressing you, as Professor uh, Garcia Mira has already mentioned, as the Vice Dean of International Relations at the Faculty of Education at the University of Faculunia. Um, and of course, I'm also addressing you in the name of our Dean, uh, Manuel Peralbo Urquiano, who wants to wish you the best for this, um, for this project. At this faculty, uh, our academic staff is equally devoted to teaching, sharing knowledge and research. And this is why we are very honored for the participation of uh, uh, in this large scale uh, project led by our um, professor Ricardo Garcia Mira and our colleagues right, from our faculty as well as from uh, our university. We want to wish them the best uh, in this endeavor. Uh, we wish to express and offer uh, our support right, that the Faculty of Education can offer and provide at these um, moments. And given, of course, the current circumstances worldwide, we hope everyone here is well 
and safe. And we also hope that this meeting will be fruitful and successful in spite of these current worldwide circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, thank you for your words and your good wishes. Uh, we give the floor now to the Vice Chancellor of uh, Sustainability of the University of Catalonia, Amparo Casares. Professor Amparo Casares. Hello. It's a pleasure to be in this forum to, to welcome to the Partners of Entrances project financed by Horizon 2020 and Research Project examining the implication of coal and transition for social and economic justice across the European Union. We hope that the outcome of the first meeting will contribute to a better understanding of just transition. I am very sorry because of the stage of emergency by COVID-19, we could not hold the meeting in person and doubly it would have given us pleasant meetings and personal approaches. I am grateful to Ricardo and the organization team of this event for thinking of me from this introduction. I've been part of its research group since its constitution. In the personal environment research group, we have been working for more than 10 years on topics directly linked to the strategic lines of the European community. As early, a result of the journey, I represent the responsibility of this university with respect to its infrastructures, buildings, and open spaces to give a sustainable response that involves, in the medium term, accomplished with zero energy demand. Our Vice Chancellor Office has opted for photovoltaic or solar energy, the passive house standard, and the renaturalization of our campus to obtain the result. I am very proud to present this excellent project, led by the Professor of Social Psychology, Ricardo Garcia Mira, coordinated by the University of A Coruña, our university, with the participation of 14 important research groups from 12 European countries that I am sure it will provide keys for the future development of the cases of study presented. And it will also generate a paradigmatic model for the study of social impact for other regions currently experiencing a similar industrial transformation. We believe that proposal for the decarbonization of the economy and society offer opportunities to promote more equitable outcomes and overcome past inequalities. We trust for the university to give all the necessary support so that this online kick of meeting does not represent any setback that could influence the result of the research. Welcome European partners and special thanks to the participation of the European Commission and the Ministry for Ecological Transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Casares. Uh, thank you for your nice words and for letting us know the policy of the University of Colonia in consistence with the objectives of the project assistance with the objectives of the European Commission. So let's uh, give the floor now to Laura Martin, Dr. Laura Martin, uh, who is here participating in this opening session uh, as a member of the Cabinet of the Vice President of the Government of Spain, uh, Teresa Rivera. So, Thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm also very happy to see in this call some uh, old acquaintances. Um, so I, I, I send you a hug. As Ricardo has said, I'm the advisor in the cabinet of, of the vice president of the ministry, of the minister for ecological transition in Spain for just transition. And that is also a sign from this government. From the very first, be very first beginning, this government and the government before, um, we wanted to uh, include uh, in, in our plan for the ecological transition social issues uh, very seriously. And I was uh, in charge of this just transition strategy from the very first beginning. Last week, and it has been published today, we decided as a government to establish a Just Transition Institute. So from today on, we will have a Just Transition Institute in Spain. So I will migrate from the cabinet to this institute. And I hope that from there, I could work with you and uh, universities around Europe on this important issue. 
As I said, since uh, February, I mean, since, since um, uh, last uh, government, when I just started to, to work, we wanted to combine climate change ambition, uh, decarbonization ambition, with also social ambition accompanying this uh, decarbonization. And that's why I'm so glad to be here with you in a, in, in, in a project that wants to, to, to deepen on, on that side. We presented together a package that it was called uh, Energy and Climate Strategic Framework that uh, put together a draft law for climate change and energy transition, our obligation as a member states that, that it was the National Energy and Climate Plan that we had to submit to the European Union last year, but also at the same time, we presented that in a package together with the Just Transition Strategy and also with strategy against poverty, uh, uh, with, with against energy poverty. So that gives you an idea of how we wanted to advance in these issues at the same time. It was not putting a target on climate and then decided how we are going to accompany, accompany that from a, a social perspective, but, but putting all the elements from the beginning in, in, our, in, in the same um, uh, framework. For uh, uh, particularly on the just transition strategy, um, we decided that we wanted, we wanted to know much better the social impacts of this um, the, co the, the, the carbonizing uh, trend that we were going to to, to accelerate. So uh, in our draft law, we committed to publish a just transition strategy every five years. That somehow what aims to be is, what aims to do is to anticipate both positive uh, effects, uh, social effects of the transition, and then help to optimize them and also identify the positive negative effects from a social point of view that have to be also uh, worked through. And in that just transition package, of course, in Spain, it's very important to put attention to employment issues. As you may know, Spain is a, a economy and a society that has still deficits of employment and if the transition, if the ecological transition doesn't work in employment effects in Spain, it will not work for people. Because that is the main um, concern of Spanish people up to now. And it will be, again, much more in this context that we have after um, the COVID-19 crisis. So we want to put a better coordination of, as I said, as I've seen, this uh, um, social impact, but also um, try to put into place what uh, green active labor policies do we need? What social protection measures do we need to smooth the transition? We understand that social protection policies are key in order to have people on board of a transition that ha sometimes have um, challenges uh, for them. And we wanted also to have their voice heard. It. Um, it is um, sometimes the case, sometimes for resources, sometimes for time, to have like national plans, national strategies um, that are um, drafted from the authorities and then launched to people. And we wanted to build together and listen also to, to what the different communities had to say. So we combine like this horizontal reflection on Labor, act, uh, labor policies, uh, green vocational um, uh, policies, sectoral and industrial policies, with um, uh, a, a, mod, a much more target um, work on different communities that were uh, already fearing the, the change or fearing or, or, or impacted by, by this ecological transition that were above all um, co uh, uh, mining uh, areas and also areas where coal power plants were going to be closed. So that's why it's so important that uh, the University of Coruña is also promoting this work because it's very important and very relevant from, for the, uh, for the uh, Galician uh, society right now. So in this work, working with communities, hearing to communities, what we have uh, launched is what we call just transition agreements. Uh, we are uh, we have launched already participatory processes to ask people in the different regions 
well, what do you want to get out of this transition? What are the projects that you want the government to promote? What are the activities? What are the initiatives that you want to build together? Um, what are the, I mean, everything, even uh, important cultural issues, very important for coal uh, mining uh, areas. So we have launched already uh, processes for Aragon and from three from Asturias. We will be launching four for Castilla Leon, for four different areas in Castilla Leon soon. And we will have ready also the two for Galicia, one for Aspontes, for the uh, coal um, power plant that is there, and also for the surroundings of, of Cerceda, that is also for the closure of, of Mirama. And we are just waiting for the regional governments to give us a green light on, on that processes. And um, I will very much like you, I, I'd like to invite you, as soon as we launch this process, we will, of course, send you the information and we will be very much to, to have, um, to have your, your inputs. So I said we are really trying, despite, despite this very much crazy and unexpected context of the state of alarm, we are really trying to advance on this agenda because we think that it, was, it will be very much needed even in the, in the, in the near uh, future uh, due to the consequences of, of, of this crisis. I will uh, like to finish presenting you a tool that um, I think it somehow um, it brings together this social innovation that we want to include in this just transition strategy in our um, decarbonizing policies, in our um, uh, well, uh, going away from coal um, uh, policies. Um, before, uh, what happened in Spain in the electrical system is that when you close a coal power plant, that power could be replaced by renewable energies in any other place of the territory. What we have done by a law in December is that that access to grid will be maintained in that territory. Access to grid, it is kind of a scarce resource in Spain right now. So what we are going to do is to bid that access to grid to the best project, not only in economic terms, but also uh, social and environmentally. And that is very much innovative. And I think that despite the difficult budgets that we are going to have in front of us, this is going to be a tool that will um, enable us to uh, move investment kind of fast and direct to that regions to help those regions to make the transition their own, I mean, to replace that coal power facilities by renewable energy uh, facilities and uh, to give us as a government the potential to choose the best projects in social and environmental terms. So as you see, um, we are kind of uh, working in, in different uh, tools. Last week, we also signed an agreement with unions and utility companies to have a just transition agreement for closing eight gigawatts of coal in the next two, three years. That is a, an amazing agreement in, in, in my opinion to, to provide this construction of, of, a, of a social accompany the change. I will send Ricardo all the information and I would like to finish my intervention inviting you again. And of course, to Ricardo, please send us your ideas, send us your questions. We will be very much from the Ministry for Ecological Transition to be with you in this project. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Flora. And thank you for Laura, great to see you. <laughs> thank you for presenting us uh, well all the the projects that uh, you are carrying out from the government of Spain about the energy and climate and about the just transition strategy that uh, I know very well and uh, and the interest of the current government of Spain in the social impact and the role of communities. In, in all the process of transition. Uh, I know about the participatory approaches that you have launched and, uh, 
and well, I am very interested in knowing all the results and reports. That, so we will be in touch uh, more than this time for for interacting and interchanging opinions and and, and reports. Of course, you can count with our consortium in order to cooperate in in any kind of uh, interaction that you need from us. Uh, and of course, we will send you the, the public reports that we will produce no, along these next three years. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you for your words and thank you for, for staying today with us in this opening session. Well, so with no delight, uh, we are going to make a presentation of uh, the general lines of what the, our project is. And uh, I will do this in the help of my colleague, uh, Fernando Gonzalez Glacier, and myself. Uh, so I'm going to share the, the screen, um, the, the screen of my presentation. Hope you can. If it works, it's not working yet. Okay, so well, energy transitions from coal and carbon effects on societies is a project uh, that, uh, as you all do know, it was funded by the European Commission in the, in the strategy for exploring the social aspects of energy transition. So the project in general is within the, the general framework of the Agreement of Paris and and the general objectives of the European Union trying to accelerate the energy transition and the, the carbonizing the energy sector. <clears throat> the, the, the horizon is to cut the emissions at at least 40% of below 1990 levels by 2030, which is very close to us. And uh, in, a, in a medium term to reduce the greenhouse emissions uh, in order to reach the carbon neutrality by 2050. Well, the, the general framework also extends to how we manage this decarbonization process and uh, in, the, in these regions that are still heavily dependent on fossil fuel based industries, the extraction of fossil fuel themselves. Uh, what are the challenges that coal and carbon intensive regions copy with? And what kind of processes characterize the transition currently ongoing in a number of European territories? In this project, we have made a choice of, uh, of uh, territories that uh, characterize well what we want to, to make and prepare, trying to, to, to learn about how these territories have uh, conducted the and manage the, the impact of the, the, carbon, the carbonization process and the industrialization of job losses and unemployment also. So the, the, the territorialization process is a, is a key process to, to explore in our objectives, specifically in these regions, in, in coal regions and in carbon intensive regions. So we will look at the critical constraints for management because the progressive weakening of the, the tie between a community and its territory, which is the, what, how we define what a territorialization process is, the process of weakening of the, of the links between the community.
community and the, and the territory. And this uh, forces us to, to look at the, the localization of the industrial production, but also to the local impacts of climate change and also to look at the role that the emergence of digital technologies have in all the process of uh, um, projecting how to avoid the unemployment or how to avoid the loss uh, of jobs. The aging population is, uh, is also a, a process that characterizes the, the main the majority of the territories that we have observed in the case studies that we have as choices and the effects of the national and international migration flows. Mm -hmm. Another big problem you know, that we have to be taken into account by the policies uh, to carry out these territories, as uh, Laura has uh, announced, you know, she explained it, the just transition process that they are conducting from the world. So the clean energy transition, uh, the economic development and social innovation you know, uh, is part of the, of the general framework because this framework, uh, more than problem, uh, for us is seen like an opportunity for social transition at the territorial level, where consumerism you know, is, uh, is, has to be uh, studied you know, within the process of localization of renewable energy production, but where an energy citizenship is emerging also uh, underlying the, the active role of the energy consumers or the increased awareness of uh, energy, you know, in what has been called as net energy literacy. But the, the social aspects, the, the European strategy of social aspects of the energy transition it has also to do with the social innovation processes that in a natural way emerge from the population, emerge from different social movements that they characterize how the, the people react in different ways than, than the governments many times. So we try to, to provide also the necessary evidence in order to see how to fit better no? what the governments design, what the, the, the communities, what the, 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 the people say uh, from these participatory approaches. No? That, you know, we were uh, so the overall objective of the project will be the study of the social aspects of this transition. And the, the approach is, uh, is an approach uh, characterized for the the study of, uh, of the understanding or production of uh, advance in the theory about how these six dimensions characterize uh, the process. The dimension of socioeconomic aspects, socio-technical, socio-ecological, socio-cultural, socio-political, and socio-psychological. Because we are talking about uh, within a context of social science of the Role of human, uh, of humans, and the role of communities in the, in the transition process, where where we will study all the challenges that we have in the different territories, the coping strategies that they are using to, to cope with the problems, and also within a framework uh, gender balance, you know, where the the role of gender is an important part. It's a seventh dimension in the, in the analysis. So the general objective is after exploring all this framework to provide a set of policy recommendations both at the regional level but also at the European level on the best government designs and, and, what, and, and in recommending also what kind of policies or combination of policies are more appropriate for tackling with these issues. So as a specific objectives, uh, we have to make a mention about the, the role of obtaining detailed knowledge you know, of the social aspects of the Indian as they are emerging you know, in the regions that we will study you know, as coal or carbon intensive regions, with particular focus in, in the territorialization and red territorialization processes that occur in these territories. 
in general trying to develop a, a better understanding you know, from the knowledge based on the evidence and from the dialogue with communities of the differentiated problems faced by European you know, communities of uh, regions in transition and the coping strategies that they have to cope with. So uh, the co-creation of this pack of policy recommendations is part of the specific objectives and in general contribute you know, to promote a common vision on the social implication and the opportunities to the clean energy transition. So these common visions will emerge from the participatory approaches and trying to put together what uh, until now have been considered separate the, the boxes. The, the role of the unions, the role of the ecologist groups, the role of the companies, the role of citizens, the role of women. So all these aspects we, we will try to put together in order to produce this, this knowledge of social aspects of the transition. So we have these six social perspectives uh, from an interdisciplinary and contemporary framework uh, that we will carry out with 13 regional case studies trying to develop and compare you know, the, how, the, the patterns and, and behavior follow the strategies for each of one. And, and we also will add three, 13 co-creation meetings in one in each of these regions, trying to, to start with a research-based dialogue with national and local stakeholders. Uh, we will do this uh, looking at the dynamics, you know, following these territories, the factors and the patterns uh, that can set up the challenges and coping strategies in these six dimensions and will allow us to learn uh, from each of one dimension, uh, socio-political, the socio-cultural, socio-technical, socio-economic, socio-psychological, and also the gender as well. So uh, the way of integrating all this knowledge from stakeholders used in the research will be part of the, of the general object, trying to incorporate more than 300 views from different uh, scientists and then from different researchers that we participate in, in around the 14 research groups in the consortium and, uh, and with more than 250 relevant stakeholders that we participate in 15 communication meetings that we organize with more than 100 stakeholders in the final event uh, trying to produce these policy recommendations the European Union and research levels. So, in general, in this scheme, you can see the, what, what is the, the amount of people that will participate in producing this uh, common vision on the societal implication and, and how this will be seen as, as, as an opportunity you know, to, to learn from, from the participation of more than 100 researchers, more than uh, 3,000 the stakeholders and qualified attendees to discuss about the, these, the different visions elaborated in the territories and to qualify, and qualify to, to discuss about the, the just transition, not only at the national level, but at the European level. So in general, we will go from, from, the, from the study of the mitigation, mitigating transition impacts generating the knowledge, understanding the, the, the different uh, strategies uh, carried out in the different territories and trying to co-create this common vision uh, to produce the set of policy recommendations that help the decision making to reformulate the territorial systems to uh, Well, these are the territories that we, we will explore uh, along the European Union our mining regions and carbon intensive regions uh, in 12 different countries, in 13 different countries in the European Union. Uh, these will be the approaches and models that we will use within the, the project uh, on the 
basis that we will try to develop theory or contribute to the current theories and models, producing evidence on the key processes of transitions to clean energy in power and carbon intensive regions. So we will use multi-scale and multi-region comprehensive research that will involve disciplines like economics, the science and Ecology, sociology, social statistics, political science, social psychology, environmental psychology. Well, we, this is a very interdisciplinary, and in many cases, we will try to produce evidence from transdisciplinary work. We have experience in, in the consortium to this kind of research, and we have also the advisory group people who is a very expert in this uh, transition, trans, trans, transdisciplinary uh, scientific production. In the, following with the approaches, uh, models and evidence, we will use different uh, approaches from different, uh, from the different dimensions that we, that we will study. And the components in the socioeconomic uh, uh, dimension will be the, the use of structural change modeling to produce knowledge from this point of view, or the socio-technical system dynamics that we will use in the socio-technical socio dimension, or the socio-ecological system dynamics, or the socio-cultural stress, another dimension, relevant dimension in the socio-cultural approach, or the technological drama, which is a tool, uh, a very uh, useful and productive tool in the socio-political analysis for exploring uh, this transition. And finally, processes like place attachment or, or territorial identity uh, will be used uh, within the socio-psychological uh, dimension to produce information about how the, the construction of identity uh, can contribute to the engagement of different uh, actors, different social actors in, in the production of this common vision. Uh, we will produce a, a literature review uh, from these different, these distinct components in each dimension, uh, trying to work uh, on, on the different models not that are very uh, Well, in terms, we'll engage definitely with uh, policy makers and stakeholders and scientists at the European and regional levels with a knowledge co-creation mindset. So we will organize different workshops with European policymakers, but also with regional and national policymakers, meetings with local stakeholders, activists, scientists, and people in the different regions. Well, in the consortium, we have uh, quite enough experience uh, about this way of working, and, and we are sure that we, we have capacity for involving people from different, uh, from different collectives. So, and, and trances will evaluate the context, this is important, the context the project creates to understand how the citizens, researchers, stakeholder organizations, and policy makers come to know about the challenges and coping strategies in the analysis of process of the territorialization and re-territorialization. Understanding by territorialization the progress in weakening of the tie between a community and its territory, looking at the factors that contribute to this territorialization as they are related to the component the dimensions that we have understood to the six dimensions, and also the effects of, the, of this territorialization and the factors in terms of societal change. We also, we We we'll look at the red territorialization, which is the process of establishing new social linkages between human community. It's very important and very relevant for building the territorial identity. Uh, looking at the strategies related to the six components on the start and the obstacles and drivers that we met the, in the different territorial. Well, the project is uh, well structured in, in a number of work practices. Mm -hmm. From a conceptual framework and a methodological one, we will design uh, 
the tools, the necessary tools for evaluating the, to the light of the theory, the, to the light of the conceptual framework and the in reviewing uh, carried out in, in the first months of the project to make a comparative analysis between among the different regions and produce uh, knowledge and policy recommendations within the framework of uh, the necessary ethics requirements and in the, in the actions carried out in the global mining regions and in the carbon intensive regions. Well, all this content will be uh, carried out uh, differentiating between three uh, key uh, strands an analytic framework, a taxonomy, that, and recommendations, which, comes to, which corresponds to the conceptual strand, empirical strand, and co creation strand. Uh, each one corresponds to uh, the work package involved in this tripartite uh, distinction. So, looking at the web, well, uh, setting the conceptual framework, developing the methodological tools, updating the methodology system, the document that we will introduce, trying to draft the states of the art of the regions, and setting up a knowledge integration framework that will allow to develop the scenarios that we need to establish the common vision of the different actors and to complete the participatory approach of the project. The, the consortium is a, a well competent uh, consortium formed by 14 partners from north, south, east, and west of Europe and in 12 countries that correspond to different parts of the territory with different levels of development, with different cultures, and with uh, different uh, experiences in terms of patterns and in terms of uh, policies carried out. The consortium is also interdisciplinary because uh, it contains both social psychologists, sociologists, political scientists, economists, engineers, industrial economists, anthropologists. Uh, and, well, and it has a gender perspective as a cross cutting element. Gender is considered here as a key dimension in all these strands of the research, both in the conceptual, empirical, but also in the co creative. So the, the organization, the women who engage in a common future. From its delegation in France, it has the role in this consortium of mainstreaming all the concepts, all the methodology that it's in a gender perspective has, has been developed the proposal. Well, Entrances uh, has been funded by the European Commission, that we said before, uh, within the framework of the Horizon 2020, and with a budget uh, close to 3 million euros within the general section of social science and humanities. It will be developed during the next three years from now. And, well, and we hope that uh, we have uh, all the success in the development of the, our tasks uh, that we will allow at least a very interesting, and exciting experience of collaboration between many of us who are very accustomed to work together to meeting with other people who, who will contribute in a very relevant way to the world. Thank you very much. Well, uh, following the, the presentation of the, following the agenda, I mean, uh, we will reserve the questions and, and answers for the, for the 11.40. 11.25 after the presentations of all our invited people from the European Commission. So it is the role of the, the Manuela, it is the, the town of Manuela Conconi who will take the floor. The Manuela Conconi is our project officer. She is working with the European Commission in Brussels with a number of projects related to transitions in charge and he will speak about the rules and guidance coming forward because she will be our speaker to 
maintain the control of this and to go up the, to what we do in these three years. Manuela, uh, please. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. You're welcome. Good morning, everybody. I will. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I will share the screen in a few moments. Yeah. I will share the screen in a few moments with my presentation. I will just introduce myself. So, as uh, Ricardo just mentioned, I'm Manuela Conconi. I work in Brussels for INEA, which is one of the executive agencies of the Commission. And I'm dealing with a portfolio of projects mainly on social sciences and, uh, some, on, and some on modeling and smart cities. Um, and I would like to congratulate you for being successful with this proposal. This will be one of the three projects that have been funded under this call. Uh, we received, uh, I think it was uh, 16 or 17 proposals for this call. It was quite a high competition. So you were among the first three. Uh, I will uh, alert you that I will give my presentation now on the rules of Horizon 2020. Uh, it will be probably the most boring presentation of your kickoff meeting, but as Ricardo said, it's important to know the rules to, uh, for following these three years of collaboration that we have ahead. I, let me just entrances. Okay. Um, okay. So I will give a general overview on the differences between uh, what the European Commission does and what INEA as executive agency does. Then uh, uh, the most important section, how your grant agreement works and what we expect from you. So basically this is uh, just an overview of the EU players and you can see that uh, uh, related to the European Commission, there are six executive agencies which have been delegated from the European Commission to implement some of the work that is defined by uh, the European Commission. So this is summarized uh, clearly who does what. So European Commission, so the policy officers, uh, defines the policy. And we, we should have uh, like a Gert Schoenwalder, who is the policy officer from DGRTD uh, in charge of this topic. And he is the one behind uh, this uh, topic, the one who wrote the call text, defined the strategy, the objectives of the work program, has the final say, uh, the commission has the final say on, this, uh, on the selection of for co-financing. So once the evaluation is done by us, the final list is sent to the commission for approval. Uh, they are the ones who make program decisions also for the future ones. And uh, the commission is the one evaluating the program of, uh, in, uh, and the performance of the executive agencies. What the executive agency does, we organize the call for proposals, we manage the project life cycle from uh, the evaluation, from the submission and evaluation until the last payment. We monitor the technical and financial implementation of projects. We ensure sound financial management, and I will add uh, when, uh, whenever needed with feedback to the European Commission with uh, uh, projects results. Uh, INEA is, uh, has more than eight years of experience. We manage in the old agency around 1,200 projects. We have around, there is around 300 project officers and uh, we have uh, ooh, the responsibility for all the, as I said, you can see here, all the graph or the grant life cycle for uh, each of our projects. Uh, in the agency, we have uh, two programs currently. Uh, one is the CEF program, Connecting Europe Facility, which is uh, more on infrastructures, and then Horizon 2020, which are two units, one dealing with transport and one dealing with energy. And um, this, you can see here, the, the budget uh, in billion so we have uh, around three billion euro for the energy program managed by uh, INEA Energy. Uh, this is towards the end, so it's the split among the different uh, um, uh, sections of the Horizon uh, 2020 work program. And this we can skip. And here in uh, in the portfolio of uh, um, 
of the unit uh, dealing with energy research, uh, you belong to the socioeconomic part, where, like, which is mainly uh, managed by me and uh, one other colleague in INEA. Uh, in total, the social dimension of energy, uh, counting all the projects from the beginning of Horizon 2020 until the end, um, well, without the last call that will come in uh, later uh, in autumn this year, it's around 109 million euro. So this was a brief introduction about who does what, and now we go to the most important part, it's your grant agreement. I used to say that you, everyone needs to know the uh, grant agreement, not just Ricardo and the team of the coordinator. Every single partner should have a, should read it. If you haven't done it yet, do it now uh, in the following weeks. It's a master reference and it's a contract between uh, you and the commission. So uh, you should read it uh, uh, knowing that what it's written there has been signed by you and by the commission and should be uh, be implemented. Of course, we will see if there are changes that are some in some cases possible, but uh, this is uh, uh, the, um, the framework that you have to take into account when you are preparing your work. So the project officer, my role, I'm the contact point for the consortium. This means that all the communications uh, that should come to me should come all, uh, it's not that everybody should contact me, but it's Ricardo or the coordination team that should uh, uh, inform me of any point, uh, of any issues. I have an advisory role, so if you're not sure how to deal with some issues, you contact me. I, the one who is um, ensuring proper implementation, so I will follow that you are submitting deliverables on time, that you are uh, doing what is expected to be done in the grant agreement. Uh, so I monitor the fulfillment of contract obligation and I process the payments based on the technical results that you and the costs that you declare. And then this is the role of the coordinator. So he is the one accountable uh, for, uh, for the projects and is the central contact point for the commission and for INEA. So it means that uh, Ricardo or the coordination team is the one uh, in contact me also on behalf of the other uh, partners for any question and uh, we will contact uh, um, uh, the coordinator for any question we have also if they are related to other partners. Uh, he represents all beneficiaries of the project. Uh, it means that uh, when he's um, you will first contact your coordinator when you have an issue. If you get a reply from him without having consulted me, you should first, you should like, and uh, you should follow what is the advice of your coordinator. Like if there is an issue that the coordinator is not able to solve and it's needed that he consult uh, in air, then he would do that. But he also has, a, I would say, um, a role in uh, between, uh, not an not automatically all questions need to get to us if they can be solved at a coordinator level. The coordinator team is the one administering the EU financial contribution, so the payments will be done to the coordinator who will distribute the funding. He is the one reviewing the reports to verify consistency and monitors the compliance with what is indicated in the grant agreement. This means that when a deliverable is prepared, it's also checked by the coordinator before it's uploaded in the system. When it's uploaded in the system, um, we assume that this is uh, fine for the entire consortium, including the coordinator. So the partners are accountable for their performance. So if uh, some of the work is not performed up to the standard which are required, the coordinator will inform us and uh, of course, uh, uh, we would need to discuss with the partners involved uh, what the situation is and how this uh, should be improved or if the uh, partner has no longer the capacity to take out that uh, work, who, how to deal with that. And uh, all partners report to the coordinator. So this is a collaborative project where everybody has to put in its uh, 
effort in order to make it successful. Uh, just one word on the consortium agreement, it's compulsory. Uh, we do not, we do not like, take part in it, so we don't have a say on what it's in or out in uh, your um, uh, consortium agreement, and uh, it should uh, uh, exist before you started your project, so I, I expect that it's uh, signed by everyone. Um, the key issues uh, that are usually covered by the consortium agreement are the distribution of funds, internal orga organization of work and internal reporting, IPR and risk management uh, and collective responsibility and decision making process. So we go now to the reporting. So the continuous reporting is the submission of deliverables. Um, you have a number of deliverables split over the three years and um, these are just some, uh, uh, advi well, some advices and recommendations to make it this manageable also from our side. Um, we ask like, to, that it's clear, define what is the objective of your report. Uh, make sure that uh, they comply with what you have in the grant agreement. I make a stupid example. If you have uh, four case studies and you uh, s realize that you no know, one case study, it's not gonna work, so we just do three. And then you, you don't tell me anything and you just submit the deliverable that is covering three case studies. That, that it's not compliant with what you have in the grant agreement. You were supposed to do four, so you need to inform me in advance if you cannot do four and then why, and then we see how to pr um, proceed with that. But uh, don't submit deliverables, uh, including what you think you can do, even if it's not in line with the grant agreement, without mentioning it to me. Um, use guidelines. So there are some guidelines. These are hyperlinked to, to guidelines on data management plan and communication and dissemination. Submit on, in time. Um, I know that in, so this is the standard rule. In some cases, I understand this won't be possible sometime, or uh, difficult. Sometimes deliverables of fall in the middle of summer or uh, on Christmas holidays. So if it's not possible for you, or, for you to deliver on time, also because of technical reasons, uh, delay in um, interviews or things like that, inform me, but in, try to inform me in advance. You know already when your deliverables are expected. Uh, so I'm expecting you to inform me, to inform me of delays, not the, the day before of the submission, but um, as soon as you realize that you won't be able to make it. So public deliverables are automatically published by the European Commission in court. This, this means that if you have doubts on whether, um, um, on whether you, uh, some of the information in your deliverables should not be automatically published, uh, you need to tell me and we need to, to check if we need to switch from public to private to confidential. Um, or if uh, you need uh, to delete some annexes uh, uh, where, or, or to put some of the information in annexes. But this, uh, I don't expect uh, that it will be very uh, common, but it could happen, especially if you have uh, deliverables which include um, personal data or a collection of data that are not anonymized. Uh, but I would like, like please uh, revise them if you see any issue with uh, some of the public deliverables you have and let me know. And then if you realize in those three days, now that you're starting planning the work, that uh, some of the delivery date of the deliverables that you have originally planned are, is not coherent uh, with the tasks and the, and the other work packages, please let us know. So this is what I was saying. So the quality check before submission. So the project code, use every partner submit, the project coordinator has a final check, and then when it's okay, then he submits. This is the tool that you will see in the system, which will uh, alert you when it's pending, when it's uh, delayed, and when it's submitted. The periodic reporting are the two periodic, uh, two reports that you are that are mandatory at the, um, during your, the project lifetime. Uh, you will have a template that needs to be answered. Uh, you need to um, 
to report on the activities that have been carried out during the implementation and uh, should you should in theory they should be in line with your grant agreement if there are deviations you should report on deviations both in terms of technical deviations and in terms of financial deviations you need to list uh, the risks encountered and mitigation measures and uh, you should be concise and not ambiguous so uh, if you have some kpis on number of meetings uh, or communi on communication or on the technical parts uh, please be pre precise uh, don't put uh, a number of meetings have been hold uh, since the beginning how many or uh, a number like uh, around 20 participants uh, took part uh, to interviews tell us exactly how many so that we know exactly what we are judging so quantify where possible um, one thing I forgot to mention about the, uh, the, um, the reports the deliverables that you have uh, it's not necessary that you write for each report uh, 200 pages so make it uh, clear, make a summary, an abstract, uh, and the uh, conclusions for each report uh, so it's clear uh, what is the aim of the report and what are the uh, fundings of your analysis. This helps us when, how, when we have to read them and also helps policymakers if uh, we need to uh, send them some of your reports or if they, they can access automatically also in the system. But if they are looking for an information and they need to go through 200 pages every time, it becomes quite difficult. So your project is lasting 36 months so the first periodic report that we will have will be uh, will end in month 18 you will have to submit your first report 60 days after that we will have a review then and then we will proceed with the interim payment and um, the same for uh, the final report which will happen in month 36 at the end of the project once we receive your report we sh we can uh, we can approve we can ask for some questions, uh, so we will suspend the time limit, or we have to reject. So I, I've never had to reject uh, or suspend the payment. Well, suspend the payment uh, in terms of uh, just for some days while we are getting more information, this can happen, but not the, that we are not paying some of the partners uh, uh, due to major issues. So I hope this won't be my first case. The interim payments, as I mentioned, will happen uh, after. So we will have, uh, you should have received already the pre-financing and you will have the first interim, at least the coordinator. I don't know if it has already been distributed. The interim payment will be done 90 days after the reception of the periodic report and the same, the final payment at the end of the project. Uh, just to remind you, the audit certificates are not needed anymore for interim payments, uh, so they will be needed only for the uh, final payment, and uh, they are only needed. Uh, sorry. Back. Uh, yeah. Uh, if the threshold, uh, uh, it's uh, if the. The total uh, this uh, total e contribution is uh, equal or above three hundred twenty five thousand uh, of actual and unit cost, so no tie different cost uh, included in that uh, and not subcontracting. No, why well, cannot go more? Oh. So the cost according to Article 6 of the grant agreement should be reasonable compared to work, actual. So this means that uh, they should be re happened during the, um, the time of the, of the periodic report that you are referring to and should be based on the, uh, on the calculations of the salaries of the employees uh, according to the templates we have that are listed in the um, in the Vademecum 
in the guidance for up for uh, coordinators and uh, so on the real cost of the employees or on unit cost uh, if uh, it they are there are some of you who are not uh, uh, listed as actual cost they should be during and in relation to the project so it could be um, um, if you have for example I make this for the final one if you would have some costs related to publication which will happen just after the end of the project but you can uh, uh, still prove that you will pay or you already have that they are already um, peer reviewed and they will be for sure published this could be included and they should be um, you should follow the account rules um, of your, the member states where you're in. So concerning dissemination and communication, it's obligatory, so you cannot avoid it. You have to always acknowledge EU funding and you, you should inform INEA about your actions. Yes especially if you have a major event that you would like uh, us uh, to disseminate. I don't know why it's not. Okay, when you have to acknowledge or for you funding, this has to be done in all communication activities, from communication activities, so, so websites, leaflets, um, social media, to articles in the press or scientific articles, and you should display the EU emblem, not the Commission logo. Um, open access is also compulsory, so you have uh, different options, the uh, gold open access or the green one. Uh, we expect that, uh, that you all know that uh, all articles will that you will publish should be published uh, in open access and that you have reserved uh, some uh, budget for that if you uh, would like to follow the gold open, open access route. And there are some guidelines here. There are two hyperlinks where you have some guidance on open access for Horizon 2020 that I invite you to read. Uh, for communication, we ask you to make a communication plan to use uh, the, um, the channels that uh, are more relevant for the type of activities that you're carried out. Not every single tool is necessary. Uh, I prefer that you have uh, fewer tools that you keep updated, uh, in, despite having, I don't know, all the possible social media accounts, but there where nobody is looking at them or you, where you find information from uh, months before. As I said, alert us if you have any events, milestones, or special things that you would like to, uh, for which you would like uh, INEA to retweet or to uh, support you. Uh, connect uh, with, uh, with INEA on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, check uh, the communication guidelines for Horizon 2020. This is also an, hyper an hyperlink. And then we go to amendments, which are the changes to the grant agreement. As I mentioned, the grant agreement is a contract. So um, of course, we you have planned this work uh, already, I would say, uh, at least uh, one year ago, um, if not more. So it's, and it's lasting for three years. So we all know that there will be situation that we could not foresee uh, so much in advance. So there are different types of changes, insignificant or minor changes for which uh, no amendment is needed. Substantial changes uh, are, the, are those changes which uh, would make uh, the proposal a bit different from what it is now, but uh, if uh, uh, you can prove and ensure that the quality of the work and the impacts of the project will remain the same, they will be accepted. Changes that are not uh, be accepted are those that are modifying the nature of the project. So you have to keep in mind that your project was awarded among 16 um, for what you have written there. And what our point of view when assessing an amendment is if this change would have been a part of the proposal at the time of evaluation, would it have been evaluated in the same way? 
So you should always remind that you, are, you were awarded for what you have proposed and 15 other projects were not awarded. So if, if you're now, I, I make an example, if you are telling me that you are not going to do any case studies anymore, uh, that would be a problem and that will not be accepted. And, but if you tell me that one case study, for example, should be modified because uh, some substantial reasons and that the impacts will be still the same and you can substantiate that, that is a change that probably would be possible. Before submitting any amendment, you talk to me and you anticipate uh, what uh, you are thinking of. You don't uh, just submit in the system uh, a request for an, um, for an amendment. It's a long and a very administrative process. We need, uh, it's checked by financial, legal, and my hierarchy before being accepted. So give priority to urgent questions. Um, it could be that most, uh, some of the questions don't need an amendment and that can be um, mentioned as deviations in the periodic report and accepted at that stage. Uh, it must be submitted electronically by the coordinator only once I give you uh, my okay and I have to provide clear motivation and supporting documents. There are also some guidelines for amendments which I invite you to, to read. And uh, uh, yes, this is just a brief uh, uh, overview uh, of common amendments uh, who are uh, not needed or compulsory. For example, budget transfer from one beneficiary to another, it's not an, it doesn't need an amendment. From one budget category to another, it doesn't need an amendment. The allocation of tasks, yes, it needs an amendment. So if you are transferring budget, but you're also reallocating the task, we need to to know to whom you are reallocating the task. Um, transfer between forms of funding from actual cost to unit cost, no. If you are planning new subcontracting, we strongly advise you to inform us because uh, if we didn't know about new subcontracting and you, we find out at the moment of the technical report, uh, we and we don't agree with that, we can reject it. So we strongly advise that you inform us in advance. Um, just one thing now going to amendment that I wanted to mention. So um, the COVID uh, situation that uh, you, your project happen, happens to start in the mid, like in the middle, hopefully we are a bit uh, on, the, on the end of the emergency, but still the consequences, we will see that for a long time. So I would like to advise you that if, um, so I already discussed with Ricardo uh, in the past weeks, uh, that you assess if there are some tasks that will need a delay because of uh, uh, the current situation and that you cannot perform. And that uh, uh, for that, it, there is no problem to postpone that. Um, uh, the commission is, uh, has uh, published uh, um, some question and answers related to the current situation and uh, an extension of the project uh, for six months during, uh, due to the current situation can be granted if necessary. Um, so I know that it's very strange to start uh, to talk about extension at the kickoff meeting, but uh, if you will assess that uh, some of the tasks that you're planning now you cannot have it, uh, you cannot implement it right now, or you prefer to postpone it because uh, there is uh, no way to implement them by teleworking. Um, then um, my suggestion is to keep all this uh, clearly documented and um, send me an email so that if uh, towards the end of the project or mid of time of the project, you would like to say, yes, we need another six months or another two months to recover what we should have done in the first months of the projects and we, we were not able to do. Then we have all the messages from the current time where you're explaining uh, uh, the, the situation. And I, my advice is also to include this uh, in the first technical report. So when you will have in uh, at month 18, the technical report, you include any delays that is due to the current situation. And then the last, slides what we expect from you. So first of all, that you know what you are supposed to do, that you deliver high quality deliverables on time, 
that you talk to me so and you talk to me not uh, the day before you are not able to submit something but or at the time of the reporting period because uh, that it's not the good time to do that because we need to suspend payments we need uh, to rush to have amendments signed before we can proceed with the payments so talk to me in due time communicate to your stakeholders with other projects with specialized media uh, concerning other projects as i mentioned there were there are other two projects funded under the same call we had foreseen an event on the 16th of june but we had we have to postpone it i informed already ricardo that will probably take place uh, um we are thinking probably in November, but we didn't fix the date yet. Uh, we will inform you. This is a cluster event where we invite the parent DGs um, and the, the projects uh, to have an exchange on what are the policy uh, currently going on from the commission side and the projects to explain what is the work carried out. And it's also a networking moment for the different projects to see if they have any synergies and if they can work together on something what to do interact between partners focus on the outcome and the impact involve stakeholder publish deliverables remember to acknowledge your funding keep your website and all your uh, social media channel uh, updated and uh, sorry i cannot remember what the last Rola, you you yeah. should have to go quicker or reduce this yeah, next uh, you yeah. are in the time of the next presentation so uh, no reference for to you funding rem it uh, means no payment so please remember to do that and this uh, keep your document your uh, document your activities well documented this uh, it's especially true for audit these are the most common issues found in audit staff recost uh, which are not uh, recorded uh, in the way they should have been and subcontracting uh, just a reminder for the coordinator to ensure that all the people working on the project are linked to entity which are mentioned in the project. So it doesn't mean that if someone goes on maternity leave, you need to, to, to make an amendment to, to include the name of a new person. That is not true. But uh, if someone is not working any longer for, an, for uh, one of the partners listed and it's keep working on the project, we need to include her, uh, her or him in the new status through an amendment. And then my last slide, if you need uh, some, uh, uh, we are always looking for experts for evaluation. So if any of you is interested in becoming an expert for evaluations, please uh, register uh, in the EMI, which is the expert management uh, system of the commission and or write me an email uh, or visit the link that I mentioned here. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. Thank you for all these recommendations and, and reminders of uh, what we, some of us, have written in the grant agreement and in the consortium agreement. And we will have to read it again in order to take all this uh, advice in order to not have problems later. Well, let's uh, give the floor now to, to Dr. Jeff Schoenwalder uh, from the General Direction of RTD, uh, and is the, his, Jeff is the, head, the policy officer of the social aspects of energy transition in the European structure. So, Jeff, uh, you have the floor. Hello, and uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm always um, uh, thankful when I listen to Manuela that uh, she is the whip, and I don't have to be the whip for the project. and. I don't have to go through all the um, uh, technical stuff, which uh, she thankfully already uh, did for me. Now, as Manuela explained, we have this division of labor. Um, people like myself, we sit in the commission. Um, I'm in uh, DGRTD, Research Innovation. Um, I used to be in the Energy Directorate when we planned this project. Now I'm in what's called the Healthy Planet Directorate, where I work on, still on energy issues, but uh, also climate issues, um, mostly climate issues actually, also things related to that, biodiversity issues, those sorts of things. And um, we, um, we do have this division of labor, but that doesn't mean that we just sort of wash our hands off a project and then forget about it once we have... Uh, um, 
found somebody to uh, to actually implement it. But at least in my case, I'm very keen to remain involved and to uh, to know about the progress of the project. So once it's possible again to actually meet face to face, I very much uh, would like that to to meet the project team and to to keep abreast of what you're doing. So um, I also prepared a few slides and let me try if I can um, share them with you. Um, I struggle with PowerPoint at the best of times. Now, if I do it together with Zoom, that may lead to some catastrophes, but let's see if it can be done. Um, all right, this is not the right one. Um, let me see. Okay, can you see my slides on the screen? I yes. suppose you can. I'm switching to presenter view, which may be another catastrophe. If that doesn't work, I'm just going to go back. Okay, can you still see the slides? Yep. Good. All right. So um, let me just uh, go through them. It's not too many of them. I have uh, 10 or 11 slides in total. And um, what you're going to work on, carbon intensive, region, uh, carbon intensive regions, that's of course uh, a place where some of the challenges of the clean energy transition uh, come all together. We're talking not just about decarbonization as such, getting uh, the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions down, but we're talking about economic and regional development. We're talking about human agency. We're talking about um, justice, of course, and we heard about these things already. But um, I don't really want to talk to you about the project. Um, you know much, much better than I do how you want to do things, and we've heard about these things. What I want to do is I want to give you a bit of context um, explaining why we um, actually um, issued the call for this project and how this fits into the research framework pro uh, program, both Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, and of course the European Green Deal that you will have heard about. So um, SSH, what we call SSH, social science and humanities aspects um, are mainstreamed across uh, the framework program Horizon 2020 and uh, also the energy challenge. Um, I need to insist on that because uh, many of the projects uh, or the calls in the framework program are about technical issues and scientific issues. And uh, we don't really have an energy SSH uh, program component as such. We are mainstreaming these issues across the program. But in addition to that, so mainstream means every project, even technical projects, would um, um, need to integrate relevant social science and humanities aspects in what they do. Now, in addition to that, we have the small window of um, uh, more specifically SSH, energy SSH related issues. Uh, and this is precisely the call that your project has been uh, funded under. And in uh, 2019, as you well know, because you applied and you won the, uh, the project, um, it's about carbon intensive regions. Before we had um, a competition on social innovation in the energy field, and there will be another one on energy citizenship in um, this year, actually. Um, now, um, you're very familiar with that, so let's let me just go through it. Of course, um, you know what carbon intensive regions are. I read through the uh, project description um, yesterday and uh, you're explaining this very well. Um, the transition that is affecting these, uh, this, these regions, um, it's challenging, of course, in all sorts of ways, economically, socially, um, even psychologically, it's, uh, it's very challenging uh, when people have to go through these changes. But it's also, uh, it's also a big opportunity. Um, we're talking about uh, a new green economy worldwide. Uh, we're talking about breaking with... Uh, we, uh, uh, we Sorry for interrupting you. Can you put the micro a bit in front of you? Because we are hearing a strong noise. In the same time. Hissing noises, is this better? No. Nope. Better, better, hey, hey. Um, um, is this, is this better? No, it's not better. No, no, no. Um, I'm afraid, afraid, afraid if I unplug this, this, this maybe, maybe, maybe a problem, problem. Maybe, maybe I should try, try, this. try this. Maybe you can uh, switch down your volume up with your laptop. That can be. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
this is this this better. Is better. No. Oh, no. No. Okay. okay. Let me, let me unplug it. Let... It's the mic. You hear me now? Yeah, better. Okay. Yeah, better, better, better. Let's try that. This is the built-in audio, and it's not the headset anymore. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me get back to this this slide. Um, um, challenges and opportunities uh, facing uh, carbon-intensive region. We did not want to have a historical presentation. Um, that's why we're saying focus on the past five to ten years. We didn't want to hear about what worked well in the past, since you know. Um, uh, there have been historical cases as well, but we want to, we're interested in what can be done now because um, we're also interested in uh, the policy. Now, uh, expected impacts, better understand what's going on in terms of socioeconomic, social cultural, social political, whatever factors, but then also come to practical recommendations as to what can be done uh, policy wise. You know, how can you actually face up to these challenges and how can you translate that into uh, policy? Um, so far for what we had in mind when we launched the call on Horizon 2020, uh, we are of course in the process of moving on to a new framework program. That doesn't matter to you per se because you've won the contract under Horizon 2020 and Manuela just ran you through all the um, regulations that go along with that. But it does matter to you in terms of what will be done with the results that you produce. You know, what kind of policy um, framework or policy context uh, will they come under? And um, just to highlight a couple of things that are changing, uh, we won't have an energy uh, um, uh, uh, cluster, so to speak, or an energy uh, uh, portion in the framework program, but we will have a portion on climate, energy, and mobility, and it is actually called the cluster. So we're going even further in the direction of more holistic, more holistic and integrated approaches that don't just look at energy. Um, we will be looking at different kinds of, of innovation. Social innovation was mentioned uh, before. And we will also be looking more to um, establish links to other clusters such as health, air quality, and, and there will be other opportunities to do that. Um, all of this is, is, is happening right now. Um, commission colleagues are co-creating. I hate this word, but this is what we uh, call it. Um, everybody is co-creating these days, but we are co-creating with colleagues across the, uh, the commission to establish these cross-links and, um, uh, and uh, connections. Um, some things won't change. Horizon Europe says just like Horizon 2020 did that uh, it is aiming for a significant environmental and social impact, that it will fully integrate social science and humanities. Um, what does change is that there's a new thing called strategic planning which uh, encompasses this cooperation process that I just mentioned, but it also means that um, we will in a systematic way um, plan what we want to do under the new framework uh, contract with member states and uh, also with citizens and stakeholders. There are a few new instruments in the uh, framework program, the missions you will have heard about. So um, it will be interesting also to see how um, the research that we are funding already, how that will feed into these new instruments. Um, the European Green Deal, just to close this off, you will have heard about this. This is the, the big policy priority of the new commission under um, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, it is not immediately visible to you perhaps, but research innovation does play a very important role um, in terms of making some of these things possible because you have to um, keep in mind that what we're saying here just transition, but also things like raise, uh, raising cl global climate ambition, clean energy and transport, zero pollution. Uh, a lot of these things aren't possible with more research. And so um, what, what we fund in um, DGRTD and what people like you um, as recipients and researchers, what, what you do is very important to actually facilitate and enable some of these things that we have said are priorities under the European Green Deal. Um, and I just pointed to some of them, um, just, tra uh, just transition being one of them, European Climate Pact, which is, where is it here? 
which is all about um, uh, participation and bringing citizens into the picture. All these things are very important. And of course, uh, more technical things as well. Um, this is more or less the same. Um, um, if you want to go back to that and maybe better understand what the components of the Green Deal are, this will help you a little bit. Again, this is uh, not very different from uh, the slide that I just showed you. Um, I'll keep it to that. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you may have, um, but in the interest of time, let me just um, um, stay with that and I uh, look forward to whatever comes next in our meeting. Thank you. And over to you, Ricardo. Ricardo, your microphone is not on. Yes, thank you, Gert, for, for your presentation and also for this information about the connection with the Green Deal, uh, which we are very pending, no? because uh, it's a very ambitious plan you know, that uh, will allow us to participate uh, with new proposals or with new contributions, part of them in this project here. So uh, we give the floor now to Paul Baker, who is a member of the Secretariat of the Platform for Coal Regions in Transition in Brussels, and he will speak about the work of this platform for coal regions and what, we, what you are doing and can we connect our work with, uh, with what we can learn no, from the work that you are doing this secretariat in this platform? Or for yours. Yes, sorry, I'm having a little bit of problems. I can't see whether, am I sharing my screen with you or not? Yes, you are, Paul. Okay. Yes, you are sharing your presentation. You can see my presentation. Okay, that, 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 that's good. Thank you, everybody, and, and good morning. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the platform for coal regions in transition. Um, so, if I can get this to work. Okay. Uh, basically, to give you a little bit of the, uh, the background, um, and then to talk about the activities of the, the Secretariat, and then obviously if there are questions, we can, we can follow up with, with that afterwards. So, the Coal Regions in Transition Initiative was an initiative of the European Commission, um, and I think it was set up recognizing the unique context of uh, coal regions, uh, faced with the, the transition away from coal and the decarbonization of, uh, of energy and of uh, production. Um, the uh, Coal Regions in Transition Initiative was set up essentially at the end of 2017. And um, the initiative consists of uh, three main elements, one of which is uh, what they call country teams, which is bilateral discussion between the Commission services and uh, affected coal regions. There is the platform, which is what I will talk about mostly. Um, and then there is the Secretariat, which I belong to. Um, and my role is as a, as, as a senior advisor to the platform. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, there are the resources that are available from the, from the European Commission. And, the platform itself does not have any direct access to the funding, but clearly within the initiative, um, both using existing EU funds and then going forward under the, the new Green Deal and the Just Transition Mechanism, clearly it's about working with the affected coal regions um, and looking at uh, projects that can be financed during using European funding. Um, the purpose of the platform uh, was basically recognizing that there was a great need amongst uh, coal regions um, to discuss amongst themselves and to bring them to, together and to, to look at the types of projects, the types of strategies that they could pursue in order to manage this very difficult process um, for them of the transition away, away from coal and 
uh, other fossil fuels. Um, the platform is primarily about coal regions, some of which are very carbon intensive uh, in terms of other industrial activities, but, but actually the focus has been up to now really on the, the, the coal regions themselves. Um, and the platform brings together a variety both of national and regional actors and stakeholders, but it's intended really as an open platform. Um, and so the purpose was to uh, enable dialogue, uh, enable people to come together both at a kind of very practical level, but also at a more uh, political level also. So the secretariat, so as I said, the, 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 the platform was set up at the end of 2017. Um, it ran uh, for a year and at the end of 2018, there was a uh, call for tender for the operation of the secretariat. Um, and the, obje the objective of that was to basically to have more support for the Commission because up until then it had essentially been an initiative of DG Enna, so DG Energy, and also uh, obviously involving other relevant um, Commission services, so particularly DG Regio, uh, DG RTD as, as well. Um, and the Secretariat's activities basically now is to take over, and we've been doing this since the beginning of 2019. Uh, running the organization of the working group meetings, um, providing support materials, transition related support materials for the regions to use, um, delivering technical assistance, and also um, communication activities and basically promoting uh, the activities of the platform and informing uh, relevant stakeholders. So the Secretariat uh, is run by four main uh, groups, uh, Ecoris, which is the company that I am most closely associated with, which is an uh, uh, Anglo-Dutch based research company, Climate Strategies, which is more of a network based in London, ECLE, which is the local government organization uh, of local governments that are involved in the sustainability issues, and then the Wuppertal Institute from, from Germany as well. Um, in terms of the working group meetings, these are run uh, essentially, uh, we're running three working group meetings per year. Um, typically, the, the working group meetings are, are held in Brussels uh, at the Borchette Centre, for those of you who know it. And we're at capacity in that we bring together around 250 representatives to each meeting and we are turning people away. I mean, there is a substantial interest in being involved in the, uh, the, the initiative. And I think it's gone a long way uh, over the last year and a half, uh, really starting to move away from just bringing people together and discussing issues in general, now to more concretely talking about solutions, about projects, um, and about uh, linking different groups together we have various initiatives now which are bringing um, uh, different uh, groups of regions together to work together um, and then on top of the working group meetings every year there is a annual political dialogue which is as it suggests more of a political discussion um, the first one was held uh, in Katowice to coincide with the, the COP meeting in 2018 um, and we've had one in Görlitz uh, this year, so in, 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 in Silesia, and uh, um, again, this is really also to, to kind of review the progress that's been made and also to discuss at a higher level about what, what's going on. Um, obviously, we've been a little bit affected by COVID-19, uh, so we've had to switch this year. We are planning a virtual coal regions week for, in June, beginning of July. So we will have a whole week of, uh, of events which will be held online, a little bit like we're, we're, we're doing, doing now. And then going forward, we expect there to be another week working group meeting at the end of October, depending on the situation then. And uh, a third annual political dialogue meeting, which should be held in Oviedo in Spain. Um, so for those of you 
to a Spanish-based. I hope that that will go ahead and I hope it will also be an opportunity maybe for some of you to participate. Um, I'm 2021, we shall see. Let's not go that far into the future. In terms of support materials, um, we have, this is being led by the, the Wuppertal Institute. What we've been doing is basically up to now is, is bringing together information on case studies of good, good practices. So to inform the, the region, and this is covering a whole variety of topics. And we're also putting together a series of, of toolkits, which is to help the regions in, in different aspects of, of dealing with the problems of transition. So in terms of strategy development, in terms of governance, in terms of employment and welfare support, in terms of rehabilitation and repurposing of, of assets. Those four um, should already have been finished. We've had a few little bit of delay also because of the, the situation. They will be available hopefully before the end of this month. And going forward, um, we will be producing more toolkits, one on funding and programs. Again, with the new Green Deal, that's something that uh, we've been waiting to see what happens with the development of that. And then also with uh, advanced coal technology. And this is an ongoing thing. We will, we will see how those progress uh, going forward and whether we produce more things uh, going forward into the future. Um, the thing that I'm mostly involved with is the technical assistance of part of, of, of the, the Secretariat. So uh, this was set up and the idea was that there would be some resources available to support regions, um, which is basically, I mean, it's, it's a learning exercise also because it was a way of finding out how, um, you know, uh, what's happening in the regions and trying to work with specific regions, but also to feed back that information to, to the platform. Um, the resources we have are, are relatively limited, so we're not talking of big technical assistance projects. The idea is that we work alongside the other support that is available to, to, to regions, so we're supposed to be complementary to existing uh, European Commission support. Um, and in that respect, I think it's important to know that, of course, under the DG reform, which used to be the SRSS, uh, they are funding several projects which are working with regions on strategy development. Um, and uh, at the moment, I think there are four or five regions that are being supported through SRSS in terms of strategy development. And of course, there are also various other mechanisms that are in place including also, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, bilateral country, what we call country teams, but this is bilateral support from the European Commission working with the regions in terms of trying to uh, help them in, in the securing funding for, for projects. So we launched our um, call for, for, for request for support uh, in mid-2019. Um, seven regions have been selected to receive support and what we deliver to them is between 50 to 100 days of, of technical assistance support dealing with issues of strategy development but also project identification project development so this is transition projects um, that they are interested in now i think it's relevant to look just at the the, the, the coverage of uh, the technical assistance support also because I recognize there is some overlap with the regions that are of interest to you. Um, and also to point out the diversity of regions that we are, we are dealing with. So we have, uh, for example, Asturias, which is a highly industrialized region, um, very dependent not only on, on coal power, but also has a lot of uh, energy, electro uh, intensive en energy using uh, industrial activities going on there. In complete contrast with that, we have um, the Midlands in Ireland, which is not a coal region. In fact, in fact it's a peat burning region, but is extremely rural. Um, and uh, so we, we're working with them as well. But also we have a big geographical spread. So from the Peloponnese region down in the, in the in the south of Greece, all the way up to Kalavibari, Silesia, 
and Malopolska in, in Poland. Um, just to give you briefly the situation, so we have been at the beginning of this year, actually started at the end of last year, we had initial visits to five of the regions, um, Astorius, Midlands, Kalavivari, Malopolska and the Peloponnese. We have formalized agreements with them now on three of them uh, and we're actually with the, with the, the fourth, it's very, it's very close um, on, on what our work programs will be. Um, and unfortunately, in terms of the Jew Valley and Silesia, we were hit by COVID-19. So those are a little bit on hold for the, for, for the time being. But also in terms of the activities, so in the case of Asturias, it's really coming up with helping them to, to formulate a, a kind of transition strategy and some planning of, of the, the, the transition activities that will go on in there. In the Midlands, we're working very much with local communities. Uh, it's a very rural, these are very small communities, and it's helping them in a consultation process and again on identification of projects which will be funded uh, also by the, the national team that they're setting up. And we're, li we're linking very closely in, in all of these activities, both with the, the national level in the case of you know, the Midlands, we're, we're, we're talking about, but also with other commission services. And that's something we found very important. So we're working a lot with GG Regio. We're also in contact, regular contact with GG RTD and also with GG Reform. Um, and uh, I think there's a, so, so just, I think one thing to bear in mind for, for is, is really the heterogeneity of, of, of whole regions and not to think of them as, as a kind of unified uh, group of, of regions. Um, so we will be working with them, them going forward now and our uh, mandate will last um, until the end of uh, this year, but also now because of COVID and everything, we will, we will be extending through into uh, 2021 um, and we will see then whether this initiative continues. Um, and I think, you know, our idea is that we will make the information available uh, you know, on, via the website, it really is about also not only helping the regions, but about exchanging information. Um, which also brings us on to the other issue about communications. One thing we've been, we've been working on is really to try to uh, also, as part of creating this community of coal regions, um, within the difficulties of working on the, on the EC website, just to try and revamp that but also to try and make resources available, not only kind of the toolkit type things, but also online resources, videos, so using social media, uh, newsletters, uh, press articles. Um, we also will be doing webinars and videos, and particularly now with the, the COVID situation, as I already mentioned, the next working group meeting will be held at this virtual event over a week but we will also be making more information available now using, using webinars as a, as a process of uh, exchange of information. Um, and so we're very interested, um, just, you know, we, we're also contacting other uh, EU funded uh, projects and, and research projects. So for example, there is the Tracer project, which is also working in re um, research and innovation strategies with some of the regions uh, again. I think they're working with 10, 10 regions throughout um, um, uh, Europe. And so we're trying to fulfill this role of trying to bring together as many elements as, as we can about what's going on in terms of the transition at the, at the regional level. And it really is a regional focus, it's not a national focus. Um, and making sure that we also connect our, you know, both as, I'm very pleased to have been invited to, to, to work on the, uh, the advisor to, to, to you, but also I think it's very important to us to know what you're doing and so that we can link that into the platform and so that the relevant material that you're coming out with can also be shared via the platform. I'm very conscious of time, so I think I will wrap it up there and uh, hopefully uh, we, will, we can follow up in, in, in the future on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well.
thank you for, for your speech and for allowing us to know more about the platform and the, the activities uh, and the support you know, that uh, you give to the to the regions in transition. So let's go now to the questions and answers for for the whole presentations that we have uh, here uh, this morning before the, the coffee break. We have some delay, but I think it's assumable within the general framework of the meeting. So, Paul, can you interrupt the sharing of the your? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just click again in setting screen. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure how I am. Ah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to to, to interrupt. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't I can't seem to un. Okay. <laughs> just, just uh, click in the same button. No, 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 but I have nothing. The problem is I have nothing except for you, Ricardo, on my on my on my screen at the moment. Okay, let's go with the, while you uh, disconnect your screen, uh, let's go with the questions and we open now the floor for questions, opinions, before the coffee break. Yeah. Okay. Do anybody want to speak first? Some question. Well, one of the of the share opinions in the chat was to the possibility to share. Nora, Nora asking to is asking to to talk. Nora. Yeah. Um. Okay, Nora. Yeah. No, I, I was just saying to to Ger and to Manuela about the possibility of, sh uh, of sharing information about the two sister projects that have been funded in this call. Yes. To, to see the, the possibilities of establishing uh, synergies in meetings. Or, uh, yeah, I will check with my colleague in charge of the other two projects. And uh, she's also having the kickoff meeting in these days, so, but I think it won't be a problem. So we will share the contacts. Thank you. Okay. Nora? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Nora Ritz, so maybe I should say who I am or so? Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> so I'm a sociologist at the University of Umeå and uh, with David Azzo we've done a number of projects on trade unions and workers and their environmental policies in different countries of the world. So um, I have a number of questions but I'm not really sure whether they will be answered anyway during the next day. So if they will be answered, just say the answer will come later. <laughs> so one of the questions is, since you're talking about regions, I was wondering how you define the region of the transition, if that, for instance, uh, implies supply chains, because then the region would be much longer. So that's one question. And the other question is um, how the stakeholders are defined, who are they, and what kind of dialogue is going to be conducted with them. So as I said, maybe that will be answered anyway in other presentations, and then that's fine. Thank you. 
Well, as far as uh, we understand the, the definition of the region is, uh, is firstly defined by the territory impacted by the, the, the coal or carbon emissions activities, but it's, it's wider because the, this territory extends to the economic, social, and the, the cultural and ecological impact on the the whole uh, of, uh, officially defined as a region, no? geographically defined. So it, it is a relative impact on the territory where the activity takes place, li very linked to the wider territory in, in terms of the uh, geographical situation. Fabio, you want to say something? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, somebody, you want to define the region complementary yes Richard so so may I have a question oh sorry I'm continuing I was asking if somebody want to say something about Nora's yes. question yes, uh -huh. I think that um, Ricardo what said Ricardo is is uh, what we aim to uh, Giovanni speaking, and um, but obviously in the um, defining the methodologies, uh, and uh, we we will uh, operationalize this general concept, uh, and we we will have to identify which part of the region because it's not it's not uh, necessarily administrative units. Uh, it can be. Uh, different, but we will operationalize it uh, during uh, the implementation of the project. But it's it is this one important question to uh, give uh, um, a definition, clear definition of the border of what we are studying. Giovanni Ricardo, if I may. Um, okay. That is a very good question. Um, if we take Wales as an example. Um, typically, the region, as in the project, has been described as the South Wales. Yep. That divide, South Wales is divided east and west by two, not three, not, not two regions. So administratively, that is not a good geographical unit of analysis for statistical purposes. Equally, South Wales has a cultural heritage which is very strong. But the coal field, which has a strong cultural heritage, does not extend all of the way to the west coast, which is where a lot of the see tomorrow, the liquid natural gas is imported into Wales from there. So actually the carbon and coal regions differ slightly in, in their extent. And so trying to unpack the cultural, administrative, statistical, and shall we say geographical dimensions of region, let alone the political ones in Wales, is quite complicated from there. So just not to give an answer, but just to say that recognizing that complexity is a very important dimension of this work. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Well, Richard, Richard, Kil Kilkak, Richard Kilkak. Excuse me, I want, hey, to yeah. add, uh, I want to add one thing in that discussion. Can you hear me? I think the another aspect is is also about the, the chronology and time of this energy transition because every region is also, when we're defining a coal region, that will also be an aspect we have to take in consideration. The transition from one uh, state to one energy to another, another energy, I think every region is in a different stage of this transition. While, while we are uh, delimiting our region as a cold region, we also have to focus on this chronological pattern of energy transition. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I could add something. Um, the, 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 the coal platform originally, we, um, the, the definition of the regions was, was based on the work that was done by the JRC. Um, so that was an initial starting point at which they identified NUTS two regions. 
And then after that, if you look at the supporting documentation for the new Green Deal, there is a new document there, which is a slightly finer uh, disaggregation at uh, nuts free level, I think, of regions that the JRC has identified as currently coal, coal, coal regions. So, I mean, and we struggle with this all the time because we're dealing, uh, for example, if I take the case of the Peloponnese, the Peloponnese is only one very small part of that, located around one city, which is Megalopoli, um, which is the, 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 the coal, well, in, the, in, in this case, lignite mining area and, 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 and power plants. Whereas if I take a region like Silesia, it's an enormously different uh, scale of, of uh, geographical scale for what I would define as the Silesian coal region. So it is a big, it is an issue, and I think it is one that's worth worth thinking about in more detail. Yes, uh, just to add, I agree with the whole, and uh, we also struggled with this uh, issue writing the proposal. Then we, uh, at the moment, but we we will check it. We kept the two levels simultaneously without selecting necessarily one of the two. We will have the administrative level, which provides us the data. And then we will have another more um, place-based level that we will better define during the implementation and some uh, attempt to define it uh, are already in the proposal in the work description of work packages but okay thank you Giovanni mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so if I have a question uh, to Paul Baker, uh, it's more technical actually. I assume that um, uh, your platform for core regions and transition, you, you have something like a national coordinators or some kind of contact points at the national level, which I think it would be good to, for us to get into closer touch because substantial part of our project is also concerning policy recommendations and kind of working closely with local stakeholders. So I mean, is it possible to get a list of these people who are your national coordinators or contact points so we may kind of approach them and talk to them? We have the, 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 the usual issue of the uh, <laughs> what information we're allowed to share or not allowed to share on um, uh, we, we don't have we don't have coordinators as such because uh, as I said, it's an, it's an open platform. So um, and it's almost the first come first serve, serve basis. So for the platform as a whole, we have a list of, uh, of, of, of stakeholders and members, but I would have to uh, clear that with uh, DG Enner and DG Regio uh, about whether or not we're allowed to share that uh, information. Um, However, on an ad hoc basis, we can certainly uh, try and find uh, the names of, of, of contact people, but we couldn't share the whole contact list for the, for the, uh, for the platform as a whole. Um, but uh, certainly, if you, if, if you want to come and uh, ask us about specific regions, then we, will, we can contact the region and ask if they mind us sharing their contact details. But unfortunately, now with the GTPR, uh, we, need to, we need to go through this process first. Yes, any other? One of you want to say something? So, one, two, three. Well, so we are going to make a, a coffee break just now, just to have a, a, a small rest, and we will continue with the meeting in 15 minutes, if you agree. I think we have some delay, but I think it's assumable to finish before, before lunch. So we will be here at uh, 12.20. It's okay, 12.20 Central European time, 1.20 for Romanian and 11.20 for Portugal and the UK. Okay? 
So see you in 15 minutes. Elena, do you want to say something? No. Okay. Perfect. So we we'll make an interruption and we will come back here again. Okay, see you in a while. In 20 minutes.
Okay, here we are again. Uh, Giovanni, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, perfect. So let's continue with the agenda, uh, giving the floor to Giovanni Cagliati and Fabio Feldo, who will present the, the project from the conceptual and, and approaches point of view. And, and they will give us more information about the next steps in the project. Uh, Giovanni, Feldo, who want to speak yeah. first? You? Okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. So we will go, we will start deepening a bit the entrances approach and main steps. Uh, we will uh, talk about the interpretation of the context in which the project is inserted about the approach and then at the end just uh, uh, we spark some reflection about reflection about cross-disciplinarity which is one of the main pillar of this project so for what concerns the project uh, the context the project uh, sees the issue of the carbonization of coal and carbon intensive region in the picture of the broader transformation that are affecting society. This transformation has been called in many different ways, postmodern society, reflexive society, late modernity, liquid society, a lot of different uh, framework of interpretation. But despite the differences between these uh, approaches, all, all of them um, agrees on the key feature characterizing this change, which is a changing relationship between uh, social structures and the agents uh, uh, that uh, agents in society. So while in modern world, the social structures, so norms, rules, uh, behavioral models, uh, values, were strong enough to um, exercise a certain degree of control over individuals with the postmodern society, so-called postmodern society, sparked by various factors such as increased access to education, increased access to technology, increased access to communication. The social structures and the institutions supporting them are becoming weaker, while the autonomy of individual of make their own choices of um, selecting the shaping their own identity but also uh, moving and acting is increasing this tension weakening of structure and increasing of autonomy of individuals and groups they belong to is causing a transitional process of all the institution that were the pillar of modernity and this transformation sometimes is also painful one of the prominent effects of this change is a crisis of territoriality intended as the capacity to keep a certain territory under control by government and other societal actors. So while territory once was considered the basis of identity, something that is, keeps this, keep still the same over time, uh, territory is, uh, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, is exposed to deep transformations. I will just provide some picture just to, uh, excuse me, I will go a little bit cliche, forgive me for this, but it's just for keeping their attention high. So the localization of industrial production, see here Chinese engineers that are working on uh, uh, Volvo or globalization of market. This is uh, Monsanto seeds that spread the same around the world despite the biodiversity present in the different territories. Digitization and automation. This picture is a uh, library here in Rome, one of my favorites that now is closed. It was in the city center and uh, you see uh, Amazon Prime uh, automatic distributor. These are all things that are changing the territories 
uh, climate change impacts this picture of uh, Bemis under the flood that uh, some of these pictures made the round of the world just a few months ago. Uh, national and international migration. This is my wife hometown in Sicily, Agrigento. Uh, in the 90s was a very rich uh, city, full of shops, and now this is the main street with all the shops uh, closed because people leave the city and go in northern Italy, another part of the country. And obviously epidemics, so this has not need to explanation. All these uh, factors uh, are challenging the traditional forms of territorial sovereignty like states and local governments that are not able to keep these uh, transnational, transboundary factors, so to keep them under control. This process is, is accompanied with an increasing feeling of dispossession among local communities. And um, this has been addressed as uh, the deterritorialization process. So, as Ricardo said, the process of progressive weakening of the tie between a community and its territory. Some areas are more exposed to this process, like mountain areas, sparsely populated regions, former industrial towns, uh, region, island regions, and here you know, we are coal called mining regions and carbon intensive regions. This uh, process uh, is affecting also our European and global political landscape, which is characterized by emerging of conflicting vision about how to uh, interpret a territory in a globalized world. One of the main vision is uh, this has been uh, synthesized as the going up option is the idea of thinking at uh, uh, the world a global territory which envelops all, all of us but this vision is is uh, as having some trouble because there is not a supranational arbiter that can redistribute cost and benefits of the ongoing process here, included the energy transition. And so there are, it's open up to free riding situation. Also leveraging on this uh, contradiction of this vision, a new uh, vision is emerging that has been called the going back option. That means uh, the hypothesis of shifting back to the state as a bounded political, or in some cases, even a bounded physical space. You see here the picture is uh, uh, the wall that Trump is uh, building with the, in the border with Mexico. Uh, this option has been backed by the so-called populist movements that are having a momentum all over Europe and beyond. Then there has been a claim for another kind of vision another uh, the reinventing, reshaping a different kind of territorial attachment, a different kind of territoriality that can be uh, also in line with global dynamics, uh, the going down position, going down to earth. And um, here the picture is one uh, case of a, a small island that became a renewable energy island. We studied that in another project. So what is the role of energy transition? Of course, energy transition can be considered a strong deterritorialization factor for coal and carbon intensive regions. But at the same time, uh, the studies of the energy transition of the past have shown how major shift in the energy system have been always associated to development of new social and territorial configuration. Also, the study of other European projects show that energy transition at the local level uh, open up for a window of opportunity for possibility for re-territorialization process. So the context of uh, which our project is placed at the stake can be also considered uh, in, uh, summarized in this picture. Coal and carbon intensive region 
are in between a field of forces that can push them toward a different situation. Uh, we put this limit situation that of course are just hypothetical, but uh, clarify the issue. One is the population. So coal and carbon intensive region can lose their historical function, can be depopulated. Or another limit situation is recarbonization. If a, a going back option succeed, they can go on with coal and using coal and carbon and without caring about emissions. And there is another situation which is reterritorialization, which means uh, develop, new development based with leveraging on the opportunity offered by the clean energy transition. So in entrances, so we will study the key factor influencing the social fates of coal and carbon intensive region in their transition process. How we will do that? This is not easy because uh, we deal with sensitive issues, politically sensitive, is a complex dynamics involving different actors at local, national, European, and even global level. It's uh, a uh, process also based on each different place because the fate of each region will depend also on historical events, on the pathway that each region has followed. So entrances uh, will combine different, three different perspectives, multidimensional perspective, comparative perspective, and multi-level perspective. <clears throat> Why multidimensional perspective? Because we know that territory has been for a long time our own, our identity, our memory. The tie between uh, human communities and their territory is, is a deep relationship involving not only economic and social aspect, but also symbolic, psychological, material, and even ecological aspects. So the deterritorialization process can be highly destabilizing both at a personal and at a collective level. For this reason, we will develop a multidimensional perspective based on six components that Ricardo has already illustrated. And we will use, develop a unified methodology involving six methods desk research, semi-structured interviews, focus group, survey, etc. cetera. We, the uh, first result for using this methodology will be uh, developing 13 case studies in 13 regions. And uh, these regions and are all regions that are based on extraction of fossil fuels mostly carbon, but we have also one region that extract oil and uh, um, or they are based on fossil fuel industries. They represent a variety of situation, different stages, as it was reminded before, different stages of decarbonization, different countries. Uh, some of them uh, are part of the platform, some of them not. So very different situation, but all the region are facing or will face a decarbonization process. So they will have similar challenges. All the cases will be investigated using the same approach and methods. And in this perspective, rather than looking for an overall interpretation of what is happening, we will have the first objective, which is a comprehensive description of the cases. So what happens at the psychological, social, economic, uh, environment, uh, ecological, all the different level. And then we will compare them with qualitative and quantitative comparative analysis for studying the, the territorialization and re-territorialization process. The outcomes will be a taxonomy of the different challenges and related strategies that the region are facing. And then we go to the multi-level perspective because description is not enough. We have to interpret them and we 
that we want to provide some information about the dynamics, the evolution that this pathway can have also in the future. So we will integrate different uh, uh, types of interpretation, a descriptive interpretation, which is uh, the one that I already described. Then we will use a social economic model based on macroeconomic data and uh, uh, patterns uh, evolution and a socio ecological and technological system model, which is uh, an holistic uh, model that takes into account uh, many different variables and project them in the future, and many different level, multi scale model that project them in the future. And in doing that, we will uh, also leverage on uh, knowledge of stakeholders at different level. And this will be uh, also accompanied by a set co-creation of a set of recommendation, one at the European level. So how Europe can support coal and carbon intensive region in transition. Then we will have a set of practical, tailored practical recommendations. So for the 13, one for each of the 13 regions. And then we will have some ideas for SSH cross-disciplinary work that is more uh, address uh, the target to the scientific community. Which are the main step? Ricardo has already presented them. We have three main step. Conceptual strength, this is where the multidisciplinary perspective will be developed uh, with the analytic framework. We, we will specify an analytic framework. Then we will have the empirical strand. So two work packages, uh, uh, WP3 and WP4, and the comparative analysis, and the outcome will be the taxonomy and the case studies, and then the co-creation strand with stakeholders' involvement for developing the recommendations. So this is more or less our approach. Now, just before closing, very two minutes of closing remarks about cross-disciplinarity, cross which is really one of the pillars of this project. Uh, indeed, entrances can be uh, taught as an experiment of cross-disciplinary research. We, entrances will combine different cross-disciplinary practice because we will use a multidisciplinary approach in the conceptual strand. It means that all the different uh, uh, disciplinary approach, uh, psychological, sociological, uh, uh, STS approach and so on, uh, macroeconomic, will be put side by side for uh, formulating the question of research. So uh, all the questions will be taken into account. But then in the empirical strand, we will experiment an interdisciplinary practice. It means that all these uh, the conceptual tools should be put into a unified methodology. And then in the co-creation strand, we will experience a, a transdisciplinary practice in merging this knowledge with the knowledge of stakeholders and citizens. Uh, this process will be accompanied by a self-reflexing exercise that will give us the opportunity to provide some new insight in cross-disciplinary research itself. We have different background within the consortium. Ricardo already mentioned that different national disciplinary. We, have, we are both academic and non-academic researchers. So communication can be uh, hard sometimes. So we can have some barriers. Of course, we, we should go beyond, at least a bit beyond our comfort zones. But at the same time, we... <clears throat> We dealt uh, in the, the design of the project, we dealt with this issue. We have, we have some resources. Uh, first of all, we will use a pluralism of approaches. We do not ambish to uh, develop one holistic model omni that will comprehend everything. We, we are okay with uh, using a plurality of approaches and uh, using them and to create a unified methodology that will cover the information for all these approaches and uh, 
this methodology will be fostered by a set of support action like capacity building uh, protocols, research protocols, uh, uh, technical assistance during the case studies development and so on. Another, and then we will triangularize between different interpretative models. So we have not to choose one or the other. We have to look what is the space in between the different information that come from out from the different models. Then, uh, and almost finish, we will produce a lot of data on 13 regions. This will be open for both within the consortium and outside the consortium for more disciplinary focused analysis and publication. We will have a lot of dialogue. We'll lose a dialogic approach during all the, all the phases of the research involving both internal dialogue within the consortium and external with other experts, with our advisory board. We have foreseen different uh, structured spaces of dialogue. And this dialogue will be possibly based on evidence on our regional cases, so on facts, and will be open in nature. The outcome will not predefined at the beginning. The outcome of this cross-disciplinary cross approach will be twofold. We will draft at the end of the project outline of ideas for SSH cross-disciplinary work, and we will um, define in month 26 uh, a revised version of the multidimensional analytic framework that it's a framework that can be used and adapted also for the study of other regions we have selected 13 but maybe there are other regions that want to um, to do some investigation about the region and we will provide a tool to do that so that's all. Uh, thank you for some reference for whoever want to deepen. Okay, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting presentation. Well, we have uh, now, I think, a general idea of what are our, our starting point, our way to to start to, to work and uh, we have identified well several things that are relevant for for this moment of the, of the starting point but uh, maybe we need some more discussion now uh, about uh, what is the the role of, the, of this project in the european energy transitions landscape a uh, discussion that will be moderated by Adrian Kelly from Cardiff and, uh, and I hope that we can go deeper in some of the aspects that have been uh, presented here today. Uh, Adrian, are you ready? For... Yes, thanks Ricardo. Um, we've only got a short amount of time, um, 15 minutes really, to have, have a discussion and I'm sure there was a lot to cover. Can I suggest that we use the chat function as well as an audio function? So if people have questions, write them in the chat function, because that way we will both have a record of the question, but also we'll be able to get through more questions, I think, over the short period that we have. It's been a really interesting morning so far. Um, I think we heard from Paul Baker and here Schoenwalder, that there's a lot of activity happening at the moment in the European energy transitions landscape uh, right now. Also, we heard from the Ministry of Ecological Transitions, I think, in Spain, uh, the first thing this morning, uh, which is a new initiative to me, uh, and I think it's a really fantastic uh, turn of events that the, the Spanish government is taking this so seriously. So there may be perspectives that you have about what the role of this project, our entrances project, should be in the landscape that's emerging at the moment. You may also, though, have questions for Giovanni and Fabio um, as an opportunity now just to deepen some of our understanding, as Ricardo was saying. Um, I don't want to say any more than that at the moment. Uh, 
do we have any questions coming forward? There's none come on the chat function. So anybody want to raise a hand? I can only see six screens because there are only a few videos on at the moment. So I'm open to contributions. This could be the shortest chat and discussion ever, Ricardo. Ah, thank you, Christian. There's a nice comment that's come through about it being important for the entrances uh, project to connect to all of the different initiatives and platforms. Christian's asking who is taking care of that. Douglas, would this be something that SBI is dealing with? Uh, thanks, Adrian. So the, the question is um, how to connect with the, the various initiatives and platforms. Yes, that's going to be part of uh, our work package. Um, uh, definitely, I, I don't know if I can relate it to specific tasks. Um, Tanvir might have some more information about that, but it would be certainly part of the communication and dissemination work packages is, is to link to other initiatives. Um, I would suspect, although I don't know in detail, whether there's a, a, a mapping activity in one of the other technical work packages, which would then feed into our work package to allow us to, to, uh, to link with the most relevant uh, initiatives. Thanks, Douglas. And I presume you will talk, or Tanvi will talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday in the presentation as well. He, he will go through all the different tasks, yes. Super, thank you. Nora has asked a question, which is about how people who are to be surveyed and interviewed uh, in the different case study areas uh, will be selected. Um, Giovanni, do you have any thoughts on that at the moment? Uh, really not yet. This is this will be will be specified in, uh, in during the methodologies. If I can share uh, just uh, um, once more for just one moment the screen. Um, yeah, in this picture we will have this first phase, the conceptual strand. It's uh, really about uh, we took in this project we took some time, like mm, one year, for specifying our conceptual framework and our methodology. Eduardo, Bryce, where is it? Where is Bryce? Sorry. Sorry, we're speaking. Uh, You've got a new, sorry, Ricardo, you've got a new entrant, Galaxy Tab A. I don't know who that is. Okay. Right. okay. And uh, so we will have, we um, will dedicate uh, some time to fine tune the, um, the conceptual framework and the methodological framework and to establish all these um, methodological aspects. So, um, we, uh, we have already identified a set of tools like focus groups, uh, in-depth interviews. These will be selected case by case, but we have also a survey that of course will uh, need uh, um, some specific procedures for, for, uh, for the selection of participants. Okay, Thank, thanks Giovanni. No, I think it's a really good question because there's only a limited number of interviews in each, in each case study region. Um, so getting a good sample methodology will be really important for that. I guess, as Giovanni was saying, something we will be dealing with over the next eight months for the project. Yeah. Giovanni, could you stop sharing your screen at the moment, please? Yeah, so sorry. Get a better view for people. Thank you. Any, any other questions coming through? I thought there was a really interesting aspect in terms of how important the territorialization uh, agenda is within this and, and the deterritorialization, whether that is an area where the project is making a, a more unique contribution uh, to the landscape of the current time. We have also a question about who might be a relevant stakeholder in the process of energy transition. Uh, that's an important question given the breadth of the coverage which Giovanni was outlining. Uh, there's an interesting uh, argument that maybe nobody is left out of this. Um, but in which case, where do we draw the line? Uh, on yes, in, in, the, um, in the project, we foreseen to adopt uh, a quadruple helix uh, approach. So considering uh, citizens, public authorities, uh, uh, business, 
and uh, of course researchers as uh, part of the relevant stakeholders to be involved. But I think also obviously a important question about because we're taking such a cross-disciplinary, multi-sectoral perspective, it could be organizations that have only a peripheral interest in energy itself, but are fundamental to the transition. Absolutely. Uh, I think the, the energy companies and uh, organizations have something to do as part of the stakeholders group. Um, and also the unions and the ecologist groups who have uh, had a, an important role in the social movement uh, provoked by the production of carbon or, or they have been an important role in the, mo in the mobilization of population you know, in favor or against the, the industry. So sometimes the, the identities in conflict you know, they are present in the territory and you need to, to establish the way to how to compatibilize you know, these uh, identities more in favor of the climate change itself or sorry more in, more in favor of the climate of the fighting against uh, anything that goes against the climate or in favor of the climate change and other identities more in favor of uh, defending the jobs and defending the, the evolution of unemployment. I think, Ricardo, you're right. There are a number of different perspectives which will come through. And perhaps one of the important roles of the project is to explore the different understandings of the phrase just transition uh, as, as well. Um, from that which is a worker trade union based perspective with, where a lot of the origins of the terminology came from through to the commission's use of the terminology at the moment which is much more spatial in its thinking about the regional distribution of activity around the European uh, Union territory from there. I see we have a number of questions around methodology uh, perhaps we cannot take those at the moment we can think about those as part of the methodological development. But I think there's an important question here about COVID-19 and how that might accelerate uh, or favor the re-territorialization process. Hirt was saying at the beginning of the, in his presentation, how important it is to be contemporary in our understandings, not to be taking too historical a perspective. And yet we can see some very strong contemporary trends which are perhaps at tipping points at the moment. Does that present a challenge for our understanding of the, of, of, of the transition uh, process? Because we can't just look at an extrapolation of the past. And is this an area where we can make, the project can make an important contribution to European understanding? Well, in, my, in my view, uh, for sure, uh, COVID-19 can be uh, a factor that can uh, make more visible some dynamics that uh, normally are um, uh, sub subway uh, underground dynamics that are not easy uh, visible. But uh, and I agree what what you express, Adrian. We we will uh, look at things in the past, but just in the short past, just last five years, and so we will be we will start the uh, real field work in one year from now. So we, we will have in this, uh, hopefully, it will be just retrospective analysis about the effects of COVID-19, but I think we, we will have to take this into account. For this reason, in the presentations of tomorrow, some uh, preliminary insight on how COVID will enter, not on the organization of the research, but on the contents of the research will be provided by the different task leader of War Package 1, the, which are in charge of uh, specifying the factors, dynamics, and pattern of the different uh, dimensions of the multidimensional analytic framework. So tomorrow we will have a first overview of some preliminary ideas that, of course, will be uh, need to be partly discussed about how COVID will enter 
in the in the, in the study of of the transition and of the the territorialization and reterritorialization processes. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, we have an, a, a couple of important points from Erica, which I'm not going to take at the moment, but this is about how we structure interviews and group interviews and how we bring together. I think it's very good to start thinking about that even now at the moment. But Tanvir has asked a, a good question about how the project can link with smart specialization strategies, uh, where those might be in place within regions and to see how this develops as part of the uh, European agenda going forward. Yes. I think yes. I might add to that though, also to think okay. about how it fits with strategies for the recovery and the resilience of the European economy um, yes. as well, yes. because this is clearly going to be an important element of the public finances going forwards for the next five or six years. Just uh, understanding quick, that part of the landscape, Giovanni. Uh, ju just a quick uh, reply. I think this is a very good point, the connection with smart specialization. That's why in the co-creation stand, uh, the project will not only have, uh, okay, European-wide uh, recommendation, but uh, it's foreseen uh, um, a, a path of dialogue, a policy dialogue within each region for, the, for identifying the recommendation of that region that will be practical recommendation for um, regional development. So it really fits with uh, S3 strategies and it will be based on the case studies, so on the evidence uh, bring it from the research. So starting from month 24, we will start uh, this process of dialogue with the local stakeholders. In Paul, you'd like to in tailored for each region. Thanks, Giovanni. Paul. I just wanted to make, uh, make a couple of observations on the, on the conversation we've had so far. Uh, just on, on, on the COVID-19, just to reiterate that what we see is there was already over the last couple of years, pre-COVID-19, an, uh, an acceleration of the process of decarbonization and the closing down of coal plants. And what we can see now is that that is really COVID-19. Basically, there are coal plants that now are not operating and it's very unlikely that they will ever operate again. So there was already a lot of apprehension about the, the accelerating pace of decarbonization. But that, I think COVID-19 has really added to that and, and is something that does need to be borne in mind because a lot of the things we are thinking about actually are being overtaken by events. Um, the other observation I want to make on the smart specialization, and, and there have been a number of attempts to, to link smart specialization to the whole transition in the coal region. One is I think you need to talk to the Tracer project because the Tracer project is looking at uh, research and innovation policy in, in, in coal regions. And the other is I think you really have to be aware of the, as again, as I said, the heterogeneity of coal, coal regions and coal communities. Because smart specialization, as we kind of understand it, makes a lot of sense in some regions. But in a lot of the regions that we're dealing with, uh, these are disadvantaged regions in, in, in other senses that they don't have a strong industrial base. And, and so the role of smart specialization, I think we need to differentiate depending on the types of regions that you're, that you're talking about. And I think that's a very important aspect. We have um, regions that have got smart specialization strategies which really are quite divorced from this process that is affecting them at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I very much agree with Paul. Also, um, smart specialization is about uh, enhancing competitiveness of the regions on the global market, while we are dealing more with their territorialization. So, uh, it's not to be given for granted that if a region is wealthier, the community will be uh, will develop a better connection with the territory because economies goes in in one way and society goes in another way. So we have uh, examples of regions that, for example, let's take Lombardy in Italy, very specialized region in uh, health care but they have not territorial, they have abandoned for excellence in healthcare, they abandoned territorial safeguard, <coughs> health safeguard, 
and now it's a region of Italy that has been more stroken by COVID-19. So very excellent from smart specialization, but uh, one of the worst region in Italy about uh, uh, re-territorialization. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ricardo, I think we're pretty much out of time at the moment. Yes. So thank you, everyone. Um, that was a good starting point for discussion. I'm sure there'll be plenty more later and to, over the two days and the next three years as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adrian. Well, I, I think we can be satisfied. We have uh, had the participation of uh, 53 people, the most uh, uh, attended moment in the morning. And we have discussed uh, about the, well, many relevant things regarding the the European policy, the national policy, and, uh, and also uh, about the first steps of the carry out within this project. We, well, we have the, the, the social environment for working and uh, we hope that the situation of the COVID-19 can facilitate, can make easy the work of interaction with the interviews, with the uh, discussions, maybe we have to introduce some change in the way that the interviews or rough discussions have been done over the over the years no? very well i am sure that we have uh, the knowledge and the methodologies for adapting you know, to this new situation what i am more concerned is about how the the approach regarding the the energy model you know, the the theoretical model you know, that we are assuming in the in the framework of the project can be affected you know, by the new economical situation in Europe or new uh, economic situation in, in, in the world in general. You know. um, so, well, um, I think uh, we have been uh, uh, also informed about the, well, the, the rules and guidelines by the project officer and also about the, the new uh, um, connections no, with the general, with the Green Deal no, that is, is immediate no, uh, in, the, in future calls that could be related uh, with very interesting ways with our project, with our future outcomes. So we have to depend on how to create synergies in order to see the, the way of uh, connecting to this with the, with the Deal. but also to connect with the sister projects uh, in such a way that in some moment of the project we will make uh, some meetings uh, trying to create synergies and common things regarding the, the projects of Tipping Plus and Cetrium that I informed the, the, in the chat. Well, we have the easy perspective, we have the, the perspective of the platform for coal regions that uh, Paul Baker has given us, uh, informing us about the, the activities that they are doing. And I am sure that we will work together in, in some parts of the project, trying to, to interchange information and to participate in common meetings to share uh, some concerns uh, that we share uh, both in the project and also in the platform. Uh, well, the theoretical approach has been presented. We will go deeply in the different uh, aspects that we will touch the project in the other work packages. You know, we, have, uh, we have presented a general view you know, from my part and, and now from Giovanni, he, go, he went a bit deeper in the three uh, strands you know, are part, are the relevant part of the project, the conceptual, the methodological, and the co-creation one. So we have all the material, all the prime material to work with and uh, to develop, uh, I think, uh, a good horizon uh, to, to the expectations you know, that all of us are creating around, around this project. So let me finish the, this meeting uh, for, for today and uh, we will continue with the presentation of next uh, work packages, uh, interaction between work packages uh, from tomorrow morning at 9.30.
So good morning to everyone. Uh, have a nice day. Uh, see you tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye